Good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for showing up. I am Nicholas, and this is Adam, and we are super stoked to be here today to talk about Mesos, Elastically Scalable Operations Simplified. I hope you by now can, not, by now can see that this is a recursive um, acronym. <laughs> we, had, we had fun doing it, so. Um, let's start doing the usual poll. How many of you guys are somehow involved with operations? About half, that's great. How, how many of you guys have heard about Mesos before? Almost everybody, that's great. How many are using Mesos as a part of their infrastructure? One, okay, two, great. <laughs> Hopefully by the end of ApacheCon, that number would increase. <laughs> So before we get started, you can actually launch a Mesos cluster right now for those of you who have laptops or on your laps. And if you do so, by the end of this talk, you'll actually have a Mesos cluster that you can try out. We created a tool that launches small but complete Mesos clusters on uh, Amazon EC2. So if you go to elastic.mesosphere.io, Elastic Mesos would launch clusters in three steps. Like you choose the cluster size, you enter your EC2 credentials and your email address, and you push launch. And the only thing that we store is your email address so we can tell you when the cluster is running. But now, why is it Adam and I that are talking here about Mesos today? We are both working at a startup that's called Mesosphere, and we work out of this great place in San Francisco. We are a young and small company that works within and around Apache Mesos, and we help getting companies on board using Mesos in their data centers. That's why we're here today. I work closely together with Adam, who's an excellent distributed systems engineer. He has um, MapR and Amazon on his resume, and worked on everything from HPC clusters to compilers. Thanks, Nicholas. Uh, Nicholas here is a hardworking Dane with an endless supply of GIFs, and he's done DevOps in Copenhagen, hacked on supercomputers at Lawrence Livermore, and built Flash VMs at Adobe. Now he's a top committer on the Apache Mesos project. Thanks. <laughs> so we have three things we want to share today. We want to share our Mesos story and how we came to learn about Mesos. We want to share the Mesos approach and how Mesos accomplishes cluster scheduling. And lastly, we're going to talk about Mesos in production and how some of the companies are using Mesos as a vital part of their infrastructures. So jumping right into the, our first section, our story, like many of you guys, we are skeptical by nature, and we weren't born believing that Mesos is a great technology. So I think the hypothesis when we started looking at Mesos could be captured in these three sentences. Mesos is distributed systems to build and run distributed systems. Mesos provides fine-grained resource sharing and isolation, and it enables high availability and fault tolerance for your cluster. Right. <laughs> Like many of you guys, we don't believe everything that we're being told. But some things started to make sense when we thought about it and when we related it to our previous experiences. Because we had seen this before. Both Adam and I have worked with um, supercomputers in grad school, and HPC clusters like Moab and Slurm are unavoidable parts of those kind of workflows. Researchers submit their job requests to the queue along with runtime estimates. And the scheduler decides the best way to pack and prioritize those jobs. And within a couple of hours, your job has run on thousands of cores. But when a supercomputer scheduler gives you thousands of nodes to run your phys physics simulations, it's basically setting up a temporary static cluster. And you're expected to use those resources in their entirety. And this is a different class of workload that you would typically see in a data center where you would think about boxes that is running web servers and memcaches and databases. But why are services and responsibilities tied to VMs or machines for that sake? A box for a mail server, a box for a database, a box for um, you name it. So when you are at the frontier of data, big data and big compute, you run into problems um, with scale and reliability before it, um, anyone else. So just like Google released MapReduce and Bigtable, not as products but as ideas, Google Borg, um, the Google Borg scheduler showed the necessity to operate at very different abstractions to break loose of the usual way of thinking about cluster nodes. With Borg, 
services run on top of a cluster without having to know necessarily where it would actually run. And this seems to be a very powerful way of thinking about operation and running services because app developers can think and code against resources instead of against specific machines. And when machines have been abstracted away, you can make provisioning and launch times much faster. I remember like my old boss looking over my shoulder when we were starting up new EC2 instances, waiting to start provisioning and meet our demand for incoming traffic. And to combat this problem, Mesos uses lightweight containers uh, for resource isolation so that jobs can start within seconds. Here is a figure of typical provisioning times, and it's actually a log scale. Um, bare metal machines would take hours to start, VMs would take minutes, and con containers take sub-seconds. But what happens when things break? Mesos seems to be a tool and platform to ease the life of system operators, making life easy to run full tolerant and highly available services. So let's do another poll. Um, who of you guys had to step out of important events to deal with um, broken services? Like half or, or more. How many of you guys have been working by pagers at night? Yep, same crowd. One of my side gigs during grad school was as a DevOps in a small startup in Copenhagen. And it was my responsibility uh, to make sure that our services was running on Amazon EC2. But even with redundant services, things eventually went wrong. So <laughs> one time while I was at Roskilde the festival, which is, which is pictured here, um, our backend nodes shut down and I had to SSH, SSH in from my phone and restart our license servers. So when I heard about the automatic fault tolerance that is possible with Mesos, I realized that our manual systems were much too brittle back then. We were doing operations the wrong way. And abstracting the notion of machines could have made it much easier to bring those services back up. So when we compared the Mesos approach with our own experiences, it became clear that this, we needed to be thinking the Mesos way about data center operations. Right. So now if we want to start thinking of the data center as a single computer entity, then we need to have a good data center operating system. You know, the thing that allows you to write and run applications on your data center and make sure that all your apps play nicely with each other. So we at Mesosphere want to build a data center OS with Mesos as the kernel. And if you're building an OS of any kind, you need to have a powerful set of tools for administrators and a good API for application developers. Mesos provides an SDK for distributed systems programming that makes it easy to build new distributed applications or migrate existing apps and services onto Mesos. Ben Hindman, sitting over here, is one of the original authors of Mesos. And like he said, we want people to be able to program for the data center just like they program for their laptop. But Ben will cover the Mesos API for developers in more detail after lunch. So we'll ignore the app developers for now and focus on the sysadmins. It's who really matters. So sysadmins, your life is hard enough without the users complaining that their service died or they suddenly need to scale up 20 more machines or somebody else is using up all their RAM. And there's always that one service that doesn't play nicely with others. So you have to fence it off in its own separate cluster and your manager is asking why he's wasting money on machines that are only using 8% of their CPU. It's a memcache fleet, man. It's using tons of memory. So Mesos wants to let you run more applications and services on less hardware without having to wake up in the middle of the night to deal with somebody else's problems. Let's walk through an example. Let's say this is your data center. There's some nice looking machines you've got there and let's run some apps on them. You run Hadoop for a big nightly batch job like ETL processing of yesterday's stock results. Uh, you run Spark for interactive queries so your quants can do their analysis on the latest data. And you run a Rails app for the website that displays stock recommendations and lets investors buy and sell. So you put Hadoop on nodes one through three and Spark on nodes four through six and Rails on nodes seven through nine. But operating systems aren't supposed to make you specify exactly which resources to run your applications on. What if your laptop ran like that, asking you which CPU to use for each application you launched? It's absurd. Furthermore, static partitioning like this creates resource silos, and idle resources in each silo are cut off from other applications that could make use of them. 
So what if your, Hadoop, uh, your recurring Hadoop job finishes early and has extra resources available? What if nobody wants to run shark queries in the middle of the night? Does the Spark cluster just sit idle? And why provision your web cluster large enough to handle a slash dot peak when you have hardly a tenth of that traffic daily? Didn't we learn as children we're supposed to share? So Mesos allows resource sharing between applications, which increases both throughput and utilization. Mesos gives you better throughput because with all those previously idle resources, you can scale out your Hadoop job to run more simultaneous mappers and reducers and complete the job faster. You can even scale up your Spark and Rails clusters on demand. You get better utilization, too. Using multi-tenancy on Mesos has more than doubled the utilization at companies with thousands of machines, where percentages were previously running in the teens. Google claims to have saved an entire data center by using multi-tenancy with Borg, a sister technology to Mesos. But this is still a lot of hand-waving. Nicholas, can you give us some details? You bet. <laughs> so this is the Mesos architecture. And Mesos consists of master and slave nodes which assist applications in running tasks in a cluster. So in Mesos, we refer to applications as uh, Mesos frameworks. So in this example, we have two um, frameworks running on this cluster, Hadoop and Marathon, and they interact with the Mesos master. We can have multiple masters in place for high availability, and they coordinate leader election with Zookeeper. As you might guess, tasks are the unit of execution within Mesos, and the master schedules those tasks on the slave's available resources. Slaves use executors to coordinate the execution of tasks, and each framework can define its own executor to specify how to handle those tasks. Well, I can go in depth on, in every component here, but I'll start with resource isolation on the slaves. The Mesos slave isolate executors and their running tasks in lightweight containers using Linux C groups. And it's here marked with dotted lines. And it's, in this figure, we have a Hadoop task tracker executor and the Mesos default executor running um, map reduced tasks and a Ruby script, respectively. Containers can also grow and shrink as tasks um, run and then, and then complete. So if we envision or imagine that the Mesos executor completes and a third task come in to run on the Hadoop executor, the container would be resized to, con to contain and to isolate the resources that were granted by the master. Getting a bit more into details about the resource isolation and how it works in Mesos, when you start a slave, you specify a containerizer. And that includes a launcher, which, which defines how to launch a container, and a set of isolators that enforce resource constraints, like CPU and memory. Here, we are enforcing CPU shares and memory constraints with C groups isolators. But Mesos can actually track and isolate more resource types that are being enforced. And that allows us to manage resources like IP addresses and ports and disk space, GPUs if you want it. And when isolate, isolation mechanisms for, for these kind of resources becomes available, we can easily plug them into Mesos. But you might be wondering, what about Docker? Containerization with Docker is already possible using the, um, the Marathon framework for Mesos. But we're working on a way to make containerization much more flexible, just like with Docker, but transparent to all Mesos frameworks. And that's something we call the external containerizer, which provides like a plug plugin and interface for containerization. So on st uh, slave startup, you specify an external containerizer program or script that Mesos will interact with as was well as an internal containerizer. On top of the default images that you can specify on startup, this work also includes extensions to how you define tasks. So when you run a task, you can actually ping and choose for example, Docker images or KVM ISOs that, as, that that particular task should run in. This is still a work in progress, that's the caveat here, but you can actually already try it out. Um, we've released the first external containerizer um, program out there for Docker containerization, and we call it Deimos, which is named after the smallest um, moon that's around Mars. Uh, <laughs> and you can find it on our GitHub page, and there should be instructions on how to get that running. 
Great. So we've got a system with multitasking, resource sharing, and isolation. And that's all well and good until something catches on fire. So Beaker knows that everything fails, and so did my boss at Amazon. One of our mantras at Amazon was, everything fails all the time. Machines die or become unreachable due to hardware, OS, or network failures. The different processes within Mesos could die due to bugs or other unpredictable events. Or maybe the machine or process just needs to be restarted for an upgrade. You always have to have a recovery plan. Fortunately, Mesos was designed with no single point of failure. This diagram highlights framework recovery. The framework client at the top right went down, but the master doesn't need to alert the tasks running on the slaves just yet. The master keeps monitoring the task's progress and waits for another framework to reconnect with the same framework ID. This could be the same node that restarted its framework process or a completely different node that wants to take over for the failed node. In either case, the framework will re-register and then the master will update the framework with any tasks that completed while it was gone. And the framework can continue launching new tasks as if nothing happened. Even the master can fail over, and the zookeeper quorum will just elect a new leader. The newly elected master will review a replicated log called the registry to recover its state about what frameworks and slaves were connected and what tasks were running where. Since failover to a new master is almost instantaneous, slaves keep running their tasks, and both frameworks and slaves will detect the new master in zookeeper and re-register with it. And if the slave process has to be restarted, for example, for an upgrade, we'd still want the tasks to continue running, especially for stateful services like Redis and Memcache. And Mesos executors will do just that. When the slave process restarts, it loads its checkpointed state to learn what PIDs to reconnect to for each task. Uh, then it updates the task statuses and re-registers with the master. Tasks continue running uninterrupted. Of course, if the entire slave machine dies, you'll lose any tasks that are running on the slave, because the whole machine's gone. So we leave it up to the framework to respond to lost or failed tasks. Stateful frameworks like Memcache or Redis would need to replicate their state in order to be tolerant of task failures. But stateless frameworks like Hadoop can just relaunch the tasks on other slaves. With all these benefits, it's no wonder so many frameworks are being run and even built on top of Mesos. You can run your Hadoop or MPI, MPI jobs, do stream processing with Storm, run data services like Cassandra and Elasticsearch, use Jenkins for continuous integration, or run standalone ex executables like Go and Rails apps, Docker containers, or your own custom service. And we built the Kronos and Marathon frameworks on top of Mesos to make life with Mesos even easier. You can think of Kronos as distributed cron with dependencies. When you add a new Kronos job, you specify a name, command, schedule, the repetition frequency, and any parent jobs, so you can build complex workflows of scheduled tasks. Uh, the Kronos UI shows the status of recent jobs at a glance, so you can quickly spot failures and get warm fuzzies when everything's green. You can use Marathon for long-running services. Get it? Marathon, long-running. Think of it like init D for your data center, or upstart or system D if you prefer. Just add your application with a name, command, the CPU and memory resources for a task, for each task, the number of instances, and any URIs you need for dependencies. Once it's running, you can use Marathon to suspend or destroy your service, or scale it up or down. So combined with Kronos, you can schedule all your recurring batch jobs and keep your long-running services up and running, all on Apache Mesos. For everything else, build your own service. Build your own framework. We have framework APIs in C++, Java, Python, Scala, Erlang, Clojure, Go, and anything else that can be taught to speak protobufs. And you can see the number of Mesos-related projects on GitHub is steadily growing. And the next one could be yours. But you probably want to know, who's actually using Mesos in production? All your favorite companies and more. And don't ignore that logo at the bottom. We use Mesos, Marathon, and Kronos internally at Mesosphere for Elastic Mesos, which we showed at the beginning of the talk, our Spark Analytics, and other internal services. So now we'll dive deeper into a few of the biggest users of Mesos. I'll start with HubSpot. HubSpot develops a software-as-a-service product for inbound marketing. 
with features for social media, email, content management, web analytics, and search engine optimization. I'm not sure exactly what all that means, but I do know that marketing means lots of data. So HubSpot runs a mixture of web services, long-running processes, one-off tasks, and scheduled jobs, all on top of Mesos. They have over 150 services running inside Mesos on hundreds of servers inside Amazon EC2. According to the VP of Engineering, Elias Torres, HubSpot deploys 300 times a day on a minimal number of servers by using Apache Mesos. They've reported numerous benefits from using Mesos. They get reduced time to deploy and reduced developer friction because developers get immediate access to cluster resources, whether for scaling or introducing new services. And developers no longer need to understand the process for requisitioning, requisitioning hardware or servers. They get increased reliability uh, because hardware failures are more transparent to developers as services are automatically replaced when tasks are lost. In other words, developers are no longer paged because of a simple hardware failure. And scheduled tasks are not tied to a single service server, which could fail at any time, taking the cron job with it. And resource utilization is improved, which directly corresponds to reduced costs. Services which were previously running on over-provisioned hardware now use the exact amount of resources required. Nicholas, you take us through the next company. You bet. So most of you guys are probably familiar with Airbnb, um, but for those of you who aren't, it's a very successful um, startup in San Francisco that makes it super easy to share your apartment um, or to be a guest in another person's home. But what you might not realize is that Airbnb is a very data-driven company, and they actually process petabytes of data. And they do all of that on top of Mesos. So according to the vice president of engineering, um, Mike Curtis, the idea is to make it so that smaller number of engineers can have a higher impact through automation on Mesos. To capture some of the high-level benefits that they've had uh, with Mesos, um, they're now running multi-tenant clusters with Hadoop coexisting with Kronos, Spark, and Storm, now no, no longer needing independent Hadoop clusters. It enables smaller teams to build distributed systems much faster, and they're running all of this on top of Amazon EC2 instances. We want to thank Brent, uh, Brendan Matthews from, uh, from Airbnb for sharing the data about their Mesos clusters, but he, sh he asked us not to share any figures. So that's the caveat with this infrastructure stack. This is a, a, a stack that we put together from the data that we got from, from, uh, from Brendan. So most notably is that we actually have multiple Hadoop clusters running halo alongside um, Spark and Presto and Redis and Rails and much more on top of Marathon and Kronos. And they use those clusters to build search indices, to reorder search rankings for their rental um, pricing suggestion systems trust and safety and fraud detection systems. And now to the probably, well not only probably, but the biggest user and contributor to Mesos, which is Twitter. You probably, all of you know what Twitter is, but don't realize the scale of their operation. They have 200, 240 million monthly active users, processes, processing 500 million tweets per day, up to 150,000 tweets per second, which results in hundreds of terabytes per day of compressed data. But how does Mesos tie into this? As the senior vice president of engineering explained, like Mesos is, a criti is critical for Twitter's continued success at scale, and that's how they build new services. It's allowed them to scale to thousands of bare metal machines and leverage a shared pool of, of, of servers across data centers. And Twitter is, in fact, the, running the largest known production Mesos cluster. And as Chris said, Mesos has transformed the way that developers think about launching new services at Twitter. So instead of thinking about static machines, engineers are now thinking about resources like CPU, memory, and disk. And just like Airbnb's infrastructure stack, this is with a big caveat. This is what we've put, been put together from the pu publicly available um, data that's out there. Um, but as you can see, several key Twitter services are actually running on Mesos, which is analytics, cyberhead, and ads. And they run on-premise. But what you can also see is that not all services are running on Mesos, and still, some are still running on dedicated hardware. 
but the services that do run on Mesos run on their Aurora framework, which was re recently open sourced, and I believe there's a talk going on in the room next door. Uh, so that was just a few of the companies that relies on, on Mesos as a part of their infrastructure, and that rounds our final section of the talk. <laughs> so we told you about our story, we ex explained the Mesos approach, and we gave some example of big companies that are running and, and reaping big awards um, by using Mesos, like increased cluster utilization and reliability. So this is a final outreach. Mesos is a result, as many other open source um, projects, it's a result of its community, and we welcome new contributors. So if you're interested, come and talk to us, or Ben, um, during the conference. Um, join our uh, mailing list if you're interested in the development of Mesos. Or if you want to contribute, um, go to the Mesos, Apache Mesos website and, uh, and find us on GitHub. And if, if you're impatient of getting Mesos up and running, um, we at Mesosphere actually host pre-packaged Mesos builds for both um, Linux and Mac at mesosphere.io slash downloads. So I don't know if anybody of you guys started a uh, Elastic Mesos cluster when you, when you started, but anyhow, um, if you <clears throat> intend to do it later, um, you will get an email um, when the cluster has been provisioned with tons of personalized tutorials um, that will show you how to get up to speed running Spark, running Storm, Hadoop, Aurora, and much more. And that's on mesosphere.io slash learn. So uh, yeah, with that being said, I think it's time for our Q&A. Questions? We don't have extra mics, so we need to repeat okay. the question. There is a, um, I'm, first. yeah, I'll, I'll repeat it. Is there a single point where you can manage your cluster? Yes. There is. Um, Mesos has a built-in web, web, web UI. So if you go to the, um, to the master um, IP and port, that will be in the, um, in the email. Um, the web UI would, would be accessible for you. So you can see all the, the running frameworks. You can see all your slaves and tasks. And that's a great um, tool to introspect when things go wrong. Because then you can go to the, to the sandbox on in, at any slave for any job and see like, the standard out and standard error for that particular task. Right. And uh, I mean, you, you can also use the Marathon and Kronos U UIs uh, for your long running services and batch jobs. I uh, find that a lot of our customers actually, the users stay in those UIs and only the sysadmin digs into the actual Mesos UI. Um, there's also command line RESTful interfaces as well. So if you want to build your own UI, uh, you can just grab the statistics and information from our RESTful API and, and go from there. Uh, no, uh, the, so we use, the question is when you provision uh, a Mesos cluster, do you expect these services are already running? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, they could be, but then they're not necessarily being managed by Mesos. Uh, ideally, you're just running a Mesos slave on each of these nodes and a couple of Mesos masters, and you'll host the executors in HDFS or somewhere. Um, it could be FTP, HTTP, wherever. Uh, and when a framework connects to the master, it tells the master to you know, pull down the or the master will then tell the slaves to pull down the executor and launch the Hadoop task tracker or your Rails app or whatever on those slaves. So you don't have to like, manage distributing and deploying all of these applications yourself. And with the Docker integration, you can just have a Docker registry that's ready to run your services right there. Yeah, it's, it's actually a part of the task, task description. Then you can give like, a set of URIs that, dis that contains tables of how to run your job. <clears throat> Other questions? Yes? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, I, I think that you could get a lot of, let, let me repeat the question. Yeah, um, how do we accomplish fine-grained resource isolation? Scheduling, okay, great. That's a, that's a great question because that's actually something that we did not talk about at all. Is how, does allo how are allocations being done? And I think you can get a lot more context, but also going to, to Ben's talk later on today. But um, we use an offer model. Let's see if I can find my supporting slide here. So if you imagine that this is the master, and this is your framework, you, the master would, would offer the framework available resources at a particular slave. The framework can then either decline it, looks at it and saying, that's not enough, or choose to say, like, I want to run something on those resources. But you don't need to use the entire offer. Let's say you've got four CPUs and eight gigs of memory, you can use a fraction of it. And the other resources would be reoffered to another slave. To another, so, to another framework. To another framework, that's right. So in that sense, you can pick and choose. And the resources that you chose would go, get, go all the way down to the containerizer, which would enforce it. So it could be like a fraction of a CPU, 100 mex, 32 mex, or the, the, entire, the, the entire offer. Um, I don't know who, who was first. I think yeah. he was first in the back. Okay, so there's a question whether or not um, Mesos itself would scale um, according to, to higher load. Um, the answer is no at, at the moment. Auto scaling is something that I think would fit better in a framework that's running on top that can provision new slaves that attach to a, to a master. Um, and as soon as a new slave registers with the master, it's offering up its resources and then the master will offer it to whatever frameworks are available. So all you have to do is start new slaves, and you know you'll automatically scale out. Good question. So the question was like, how does Hadoop and or how does Mesos and Hadoop interact with respect to Yarn? Uh, we don't have the Mesos Yarn integration yet. But uh, so like Airbnb is uh, using Hadoop 1. Uh, so you can think of the job tracker as the framework, and then the task tracker as the executor. And then we actually wrap the, you know, whichever scheduler you choose, fair scheduler, capacity scheduler, we wrap that with a Mesos uh, scheduler. And that way, uh, Mesos will be providing these resource offers, and then Hadoop can figure out how to distribute that among the different jobs. So the question was about uh, dynamically resizing containers, specifically with Hadoop. Okay, I haven't dug into that too much in detail, but from what I understand, I mean, the resizing is really just about what resources are available to a particular executor to launch its tasks. Uh, so in this case, a task tracker, uh, I mean, I suppose you can, I think you can update the number of slots dynamically. You, you could, so, so the, sure. The, there are different resource types. It's, only a matter, it's not only a matter of, an, let's say, an integer would be like a number of CPUs. It'd also be a set, right, where you, know, you could have every particular slot so you would know which slot, right? Yeah. Um, or you could have ranges as you do when you do um, ports. Uh, ports, TCP ports. So there are different resource types where one of them um, could fit 
that particular use case. When, yeah. when you start a slave, you, you, can, you can add those kind of extra attributes. For example, you say, well, this, this machine, this box has four extra GP GPUs, or it's, it's a box that has this particular version of the kernel. Yeah. Or if you, only wanted to make, if you wanted to make sure that you were only running one Cassandra uh, service on each node, never more than that, you can make, make up some dummy resource that's called a Cassandra slot. And there's only one of those on each node. And once you know, we've given you, you know, the master will offer a framework, the Cassandra framework, hey, here's a node with one Cassandra slot. And then the Cassandra framework will launch one there. And then we offer you another set of resources on that node. And we say, we don't have any Cassandra slots, though. And then the Cassandra framework can just ignore it. So Mesos is a two-level scheduler. So we try to keep the core master scheduler pretty thin and simple and rely on the frameworks to handle their own custom behavior. Good question. So the question was, if uh, in order to keep my long-running processes running, do I need to keep the scheduler itself running? Uh, the answer is no, not really. Uh, the frameworks, once the framework launches each of these tasks, they'll just keep running even if the framework disconnects. You could launch the framework inside the Mesos cluster. If you're using Marathon, for example, then the Marathon framework is running, and it will launch these frameworks as um, you know, containers within Mesos, yeah. and those containers can manage the long-running services. And Marathon will make sure if the framework, if your framework dies, it will make sure that it gets relaunched somewhere else. Also, I want to clarify, um, let's say if you are running, you're building your own framework, then you will need to think about high availability of that framework. And um, a framework like Marathon does that. It would use the same zookeeper cluster um, to do coordination of multiple Marathon instances um, being running. But um, Airbnb uses the, the use case that uh, Adam just said, where the framework processes are actually being run by Marathon that then connects to the same master. Question in the back. OK, good question. Two questions, really. Um, so the first one, uh, wait, sorry, I blanked thinking about the second question. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. The minimum number of compute nodes where it start to make sense. Um, well, it's been, it's been an, um, a frequently asked question. Yeah. And the, the, the smallest um, cluster that we, we run is six nodes, because we want to have three nodes for, for our masters to have highly available masters. And then from that point on, you can have an arbitrary number of slaves. You can start from, I would say it makes sense from like the fourth, fourth slave to the fifth to the sixth, not only for, um, for increased utilization, but for, for reliability. Right. Yeah. And, and some of it just depends on what you're trying to do with your Mesos cluster. Because you know, if you don't mind manually SSHing into four compute nodes and starting your services, and then you don't really need a Mesos cluster. But uh, I mean, it does provide isolation, especially if you're only running one service. But if you want the isolation, because you're running two different frameworks, uh, Mesos helps with that. If you want the easy scaling, um, you know, Mesos helps you go from three nodes to 1,000 nodes. The, the second question was the, the bare metal up. The, the only thing that is running um, that's important to run is a Mesos slave process. And when a job is being started or an executive is being started, that is starting underneath, underneath that slave process and that's being isolated with C groups. Um, does that make sense? The only thing you need to, to have running on a, on a compute node is a slave process. And, and you can run that on bare metal or on VMs. It doesn't really matter. Um, Yes, it uses, all, it uses C groups to handle all of that, uh, which is built into Linux. Uh, you can run all this on Mac OS too, but uh, you don't get all the C groups isolation. So you say it's built into Linux, you're actually running Linux on the hardware, maybe it's not Well, it's, it's not a part of Meso or a part of Linux. It's running on top. It's, it's, right. It's, 
Oh, yes, yeah, but yes. We're, we're not the on-node operating system, right? You would run Linux, like Ubuntu, uh, Red Hat, whatever you want, um, as long as it's modern enough to support C groups. So you're running some Linux on each of your servers or each of your VMs, and then you start a Mesos slave process within that, and then that manages talking to the master nodes, which are also running on some Linux box somewhere, and starting processes and running all the tasks. So, like, if I'm, I'm constantly losing my mental mapping space, what it actually does, this is something you would run on a cloud stack cluster, not replace a cloud stack cluster. True. Okay. You can run this on cloud stack. You can run it on EC2. You can run it on any, any virtualized system or on-premise uh, hard, bare metal hardware. So this question. One right. last question. Oh, well, I had two, but I'll OK, uh, we'll see if we can do two. Um, I mean, Twitter is running it on thousands of nodes. I can't specify how many thousands, but uh, I, we have not run into scalability issues at that scale. What, when Absolutely. Uh, the question is whether it's good for just bringing up long-running services like Cassandra. Uh, Marathon is built specifically for that. Uh, you, you, know, you only need to have, let's say you only need to have one Cassandra service running. You can you know, use Marathon to make sure that there's always one running. And Mesos will just automatically uh, launch it on one of the slave nodes. You don't even have to care which slave node, um, and we'll just manage that for you. All right, cool. one more. It, it does, and it's, it's a high frequency um, API between uh, Mesos Master and the framework. So for every task. So for interactive requests, so if you, if you have these services already running, uh, then the framework can talk directly to the task. So you don't, the resource offers is just to get the initial um, services up and running. Or for batch jobs, it's to run the actual batch jobs. But for interactive services, it's, you usually have the task already running and you would have the framework as a client that just connects to the task. Uh, for some other things like Spark queries, it may be uh, that you do just want to run these really fast interactive queries that, where you'll be launching tasks on the fly. And Mesos is very lightweight. Uh, it's a very fast uh, offer mechanism. So we can go about as fast as you know, a few network messages. Ah, very good. Uh, question was about security in Mesos. Uh, so right now we have uh, framework and soon slave authentication, uh, so that you can make sure that the framework no the that only uh, authenticated frameworks, only approved frameworks register. So nobody's going to be running Bitcoin mining on your Mesos cluster unless you want to let them, or that nobody's going to you know, have their laptop attached to your Mesos cluster as a slave and start stealing tasks. Uh, so we've got that right now. We're looking into, uh, we're actively working on authorization and um, Kerberos and uh, encryption. Uh, yeah, and SSL encryption over all the channels. So that's a work in progress, but uh, actively being worked on. Um, right now, you put, trust your users or firewall it, yeah. Uh, and if you could have just some edge nodes that are, you know, the frameworks that actually interact with it, a kind of isolated cluster. But at a lot of these companies, they, you know, have some inherent trust in their users, but not all companies can trust all their customers. So yeah. I think we're about out of time. Uh, if you have any further questions, you can come talk to us. Uh, 
after the talk, outside, we'll be around. Thank you very much. <laughs>